Today, as we read in our scripture in Mark 10, we're going to be talking about a man called the rich young ruler. And he is exactly who they said, rich, young. He was a family that were rulers. He was educated. He was also very polite and respectful. He did things well. He had heard about Jesus, and he knew that there was something special about this man. The rich young ruler was interested in his eternal life. He wanted to know if there was anything more that he could do to assure his inheritance in God's kingdom. Now, the writer of Mark, we're told, was John Mark, who we're told that went on uh, missionary journeys with Paul and Barnabas, and ended up going on missionary journeys with Peter. And the interesting thing about Mark's writings are that he writes down emotions of the people involved in the situations and the stories. He also writes down the actual words of Jesus, where some of the other Gospels are more focused on the works, on the miracles, on the power of Jesus. Mark talks about the words that Jesus said and how they impacted the lives of the people that he was talking to. And that, that is really pronounced in this story, which is found in Mark 10. And I'm sure we've all heard this story, but I want to bring out a couple of new things that impacted my life as I was studying it, and hopefully they will yours also. And I want to say, first of all, that if it were not for the grace of God, we would all be in the same position as this young man. We would not know that we had a need for Christ, our Savior. We would think that we had to do our spiritual walk. We had to do it all on our own. And our relationship with God would be conditioned upon how we act and what we do. And it is on what we do, but it's not works. It's on our faith in Jesus. In this story, this young man felt like he could be good enough by keeping the law and by doing right things. He was earnest and he was zealous. He was anxious to come to Christ. And the scripture says he came running to him. He was reverent and respectful. He kneeled before him, not in a worshipful manner, but in a reverent manner, being respectful to this teacher. And he called him teacher. He was thinking about his soul. He was concerned about eternity. And evidently, by his outward behavior, he was also a very moral man. If we were looking for someone for our daughters or granddaughters to marry, we would probably like this guy because he had money and he was respectful. And he was concerned about other issues than himself. But he was delusional, just as mankind has been since the fall of Adam. We think that Salvation, in ourselves, we think that salvation comes from doing good things. We don't deny the grace of God. We accept his salvation plan for us, his sacrifice he made for us. And then too often we'll walk back from that grace and we'll get back into works. How do I live up to this sacrifice that Jesus made for me? And we'll go, oh, I'll do it by obeying the Ten Commandments, or I'll do it by obeying the Sermon on the Mount, or any other list of rules that we come up with that we think will make us a better person. This man thought that his eternal life, his eternal security, was by his decision to do right things and then following through with those. 
He was, he was ignorant of God's righteousness because he had not placed his faith in Christ. And he thought also that obeying the laws of God, the Ten Commandments at that time, had to do with outward behavior, not inner faith. When we read verses 19 and 20, let me just read those. We don't have numbers on our scriptures. Can't read it to you because I can't find it. But we know that we don't want to be saved by works. And we know that we can't keep the law perfectly. Paul wrote in Galatians, For as many are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. When Jesus came, it was not to teach salvation by obedience to the law, but that it was impossible to fulfill the law in our own selves without his grace. Now, this young man was righteous. He said, I have kept the law since I was a boy. Jesus had said to him, you know the commandments. Don't murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said, teacher, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. When Pastor Dave and I were talking Thursday, I was telling him about how I had received Jesus as a very young child at three years old, and I truly believe I was born again spiritually. But then my walk with the Lord became a walk of do's and don'ts, and so afraid that the don'ts were outweighing the do's that I lived in constant fear of God's punishment and his wrath. And I knew within myself that there was no way I could ever be good enough to inherit the kingdom of God without even knowing I'd already received it through his grace and through his sacrifice on the cross. Too many of us get hung up with, oh, no, I messed up here. Oh, I must do penance for this. Oh, let me try a little bit harder. And always knowing that in ourselves we can never equal or match the righteousness of God. That's man's lie within us, that we can on our own be righteous enough to qualify for what God has planned for us. We just have to acknowledge, I can't do this on my own. I really need your help, Lord, to help me through this. And we also know that that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to for help us walk through the sins that we commit and to be righteous before God. Now, when this young man said, I've done all of this, I have kept the law, he probably wasn't familiar with the law that Jesus laid down on the Sermon on the Mount, as recorded in Matthew, where adultery, he believed, the young man believed, was intercourse, not lust. And killing was murder, not anger. Stealing was theft, not covetousness. Bearing false witness was openly lying about someone, not insinuating a falseness or thinking evil. Or that fraud was taking another person's property, not wanting it. See, these second things, the wanting someone else's property, the lust, the anger, are all violations of the Ten Commandments. He thought that parental honor was saying ma'am and sir, instead of reverencing his parents' name, honoring their wishes, and taking care of them in their old age. His third delusion was that he thought he had actually obeyed God's law and was worthy of God's acceptance in and of himself. He was prideful, and he was self-righteous. Now Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, 
one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come, take up your cross, and follow me. And he was sad at the saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. When Jesus said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. He was wanting the young man to recognize he was not just a teacher of the law, not just teaching works as the Jewish believed, but he was saying, I am one with God, and you need to believe that I am God, not just a teacher. And when he told him, you need to go sell all you have and give it to the poor and take up your cross and follow me, he was hitting the man right where he lived. He was saying, you are so proud of being righteous and keeping the law. You are so proud of your wealth. You are so proud that you have done all of these things, and it won't do it for you. I've heard so many sermons how the young man went away sorrowful, and we've always thought, and that was the end of the story. But what Jesus was doing was convicting him of his unbelief, convicting him of his self-righteousness and of his pride. And isn't that how it works with each one of us? How do we come to know the Lord Jesus without being convicted of our unbelief, without being known, making it known to us that we need a Savior? And that's what Jesus was doing. He was saying, you are so prideful. You are so tenaciously clinging to your wealth that you are not going to make it to heaven this way. You have to realize these things are wrong and that you need a savior. So when the young man walked away sorrowfully, is that the end of the story? I believe that that is the end of the point that Jesus was making right then. How many times have you been convicted of your sin and been too prideful or arrogant to acknowledge it? You say, yes, Lord, I know I did that, but. I know I sinned over here, but. They had it coming. I had a right to do it. And does the Holy Spirit just go away and stop convicting us? Does he say, that's it? You don't get another chance? No. He keeps wooing us and calling us to him so that we stop our rebellion and we stop our self-righteousness and our pride and we give ourselves to the Lord to make him what he wants us to be. When Jesus looked on that young man with love, it doesn't say judgment and condemnation. It says love. Jesus loved him enough to point out his sin to him and to let him know the error of his ways and that there was a better way to do it. And that's how he calls sinners, people who have never committed their lives to him, how he calls them to become part of his family. And those of us who have accepted Jesus, that's how he calls us to get back in step, how he calls us to grow. There are several things in the Bible where Jesus said one thing. And he, he said this um, in Luke 10, 42, where Mary chose the one, one thing needful to sit at Jesus' feet and hear his words. And the man who was born blind and was healed by Jesus said, one thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. And Paul said in his writings, one thing I do Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And Jesus said one thing to this young man. He was pointing out 
the sin and the unbelief and the self-righteousness that was keeping him from believing that Jesus was the Savior. Jesus went on and made the point of how it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not because it's a sin to have wealth, but if the wealth is the God, is the thing we cling to for our security and our salvation without having faith in God, then those riches will keep us out of heaven. The most deceitful thing and the most dangerous thing about riches is the love of money and the love of the world will keep us from placing our faith in Jesus. With man, without our Savior, salvation is an utter impossibility. But with God, all things are possible. So whatever our situation is, wherever we have been, wherever we are right now, salvation is possible through God. And when we've walked away, he's there waiting for us to repent for us to confess our sins and allow him to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's there waiting for us to turn back to him and follow the path. In the words of John Newton, he said, when I get to heaven, there are three things that I am absolutely sure of. One is that I am sure that very many will be there whom I never expected to see. I am sure that many will be there whom I fully expected would be there. But the most astonishing thing of all will be the fact that I will be there too. We are not the judges of everyone's walk. Jesus is the judge, and he will judge as he sees fit. Later, before he died, John Newton said, what I've been trying to preach to you is, I am an old man, I can't remember much, but I do remember two things. I am a great sinner, and Jesus Christ is a great Savior. May this great God and Savior save you by his grace for the glory of his own name. We are here as Christians, walking in this world, believing in him as our Savior, for the glory and honor of God. And as we walk our daily walk, let's remember we are not here for ourselves. We don't do this on our own, but we are here to glorify God.